Okay. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the TELUS Lunch and Learn series. And I am Dr. Anthony J. Martin from Emory University in Atlanta. I'm in the Department of Environmental Sciences at Emory. I'm a professor of practice, which means I practice what I profess in my job. Uh, and in environmental sciences, I am a geologist and paleontologist. So what we're going to learn today about the Georgia coast is going to be from my geological perspective, my paleontological perspective, and well, you just watch to see what else is going to be happening in terms of these perspectives. So now I'm going to go to a slideshow and we're going to look at some beautiful pictures of the Georgia coast. So if you haven't seen the Georgia coast in a while because you've been at home, yeah, I, I know how you feel. <laughs> so sometimes what I do is I just take a look at these pictures and like my background today and that helps. A lot of these pictures then are also going to be from my perspective as someone who looks at the ground a lot. Paleontologists do this a lot anyway. Geologists will look down and up. I do a combination of those two, but I also like going to the Georgia coast to look at other things because I am ick. As you can see with the Twitter handle, I am an ichnologist. So what is ichnology? Ichnology is the science of traces. So traces, you can have modern traces and fossil traces. The examples I have here are, for instance, a fossil insect trackway that's on the left. That's from the late Jurassic of Patagonia, Argentina. Those are about 155 million years old but they look clear as day, don't they? Over on the right from St. Catherine's Island on the Georgia coast, there are modern beetle tracks left in the sand there. So I alternate between neoechnology, the study of modern traces, and then paleoechnology, the study of fossil traces. So you don't want to confuse this. Ichnology, isn't that the study of fish? <laughs> no, not at all. It's the study of traces. So the study of, you don't want to get this mixed up because you don't want to get slapped by Batman. So with the study of traces, what are different types that we have? Well, we have tracks, of course, as I already showed you. You have burrows, 
borings, trails, nests, tooth traces, healed injuries also count as traces. Feces of any kind, so whether that's paleo doo-doo or modern doo-doo, that counts as a trace. Gastrolists are stomach stones that dinosaurs and some other animals have had to help grind up their food. Cocoons that you might find from an insect also counts as a trace. And then roots, as they are sending their roots down into the soil, also can leave traces as a result. And I have a couple of examples here of leaves. So you can walk out in your backyard or just go to the local park and you can see examples of ichnology right there preserved in the leaves where the insects have bitten into those leaves. So examples of how I've used this in my research, for example, on the Georgia coast on the right, there's a sandhill crane track. To the left, is a theropod dinosaur track. These are actually at about the same size. So I like to say that the Georgia coast helps me better see fossil traces because it develops a search image in which I can look at the ground, see these modern traces, and then apply that to whatever I might see in the rock record. So the dinosaur track on the left, for instance, from, is from Victoria, Australia. It's about 105 million years old. Now the tracks on the left, those are about the same age as the insect tracks I showed you earlier. Those are from Patagonia, Argentina. They are mammal tracks and you can see the little pattern of boop, 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 where the mammal was just going with diagonal walking across a sandy surface with front foot, back foot, making this alternating pattern. On the right, that is from a beach dune mouse. So this is from a mouse that was doing exactly the same behavior on a sand dune on Little St. Simon's Island. And if you look closely, look in the middle, you'll actually see there's the little tail drag from that mouse. So again, this is how I alternate between modern and fossil traces for interpreting what we see in the geologic record. And I owe the Georgia coast a lot of debt in training me to be able to see these fossil traces. So you might think of paleontologists and geologists. Here we are, yep, we got our hats, we got our vests on. We're out in the field, yep, we're picking up rocks and we're looking at rocks. We're looking at fossils. So ichnologists, yes, we do some of that too. So we very much, I'm a geologist, paleontologist, sure, yeah, I do that. And there I am on the coast of Victoria. The previous was uh, in Montana, so I was looking at rocks from the Cretaceous period that were about 75 million years ago. Here in Australia, I'm looking at rocks that are about 105 to 110 million years old. Oh, whoa, wait a minute. Is this technology research? <laughs> well, yeah, if you're me, it is because traces are everywhere. So here I am riding my bike on uh, Jackal Island on the beach. There's my wife, Ruth, there where we stopped and we saw these little collections of clams, these clams that were congregating in these spots as we were riding our bikes down the beach. Hmm, so it's a little beach mystery. What's going on here? Well, it turns out that these little clams, these are dwarf surf clams, were congregating around this whelk. And this whelk, you can see over here on the right, that we excavated. I recognize that little flap of sand as being the calling card of a buried whelk. It buried itself at low tide, but then there's this mystery of why did all the little clams congregate around it? Why was it so, why was it so, um, exciting there? Okay, and then the whelk, then the whelk buried itself at low tide because at low tide, the sand was a little more liquid, but the whelk also doesn't want to be stuck out there at low tide. Makes sense, right? What happened is, look over here. All of these clams are following in the wake of the whelk. As the whelk was burying itself, it actually fluidized that sediment. So the whelks are acting as easier places for those little clams, which also don't want to be out during low tide actually burying themselves down into the sand. So the whelk burrowing then liquefied the sand 
and then made it easier for the dwarf surf plants to bury themselves. So it's kind of like localized quicksand. So here's the steps again, just in case there's going to be an exam at the end of this. No, there isn't. <laughs> the, the whelk is burying itself. The whelk does bury it itself, but it, that liquefies the sand around it, which then enables the clams to bury themselves. Oh, wait, that last picture, that looks a little dramatic. Some of the little clams are missing. They're out of their holes. And you're seeing little tracks all around there. What happened? It's a mystery worthy of Sherlock Holmes. Well, guess who showed up on the scene? Yes, right, a sanderling, 30 grams of pure avian fury, out looking for a molluscan morsel or two. And boy, did it hit the mother load when it found these concentrated areas of clams, which happened to think they were going to be safe, burying themselves around these whelks, but <laughs> the sanderling had another thought about this. So what these traces are telling us is that the whelk is burying itself to protect itself at low tide. The clams are burying themselves to protect themselves at low tide, and they are being helped by the whelks. But what unwittingly happens, what unwittingly happens is that they concentrated the clams so that the sanderlings more easily found them. Oh, poor clams. But what also happened was that gulls then landed and they saw these, where these whelks were buried. They're kind of like avian ichnologists. They pried up these whelks, and then the sanderlings came in and chowed down on little crustaceans and clams that were underneath where the whelks were buried. So is one big smorgasbord, one big local food web that you can tell this all through traces. So I like to think of this as an example of why ichnology rules. And I can't see how you can disagree with me at this point. Okay, so we're gonna back up a little bit with geology. Now, if some of you are up in Rome, Georgia, or you up in the Northwestern corner of Georgia, it's complicated geologically speaking. You're in the Valley and Ridge, but you're also close to uh, some of the faults that run through that area. And then over to the east, you have the Blue Ridge. I'm down in the Piedmont right now in Atlanta. But then if you go to mine, then you're looking at sedimentary rocks that are down in the southern part. So it's mostly metamorphic igneous and sedimentary rock in the northern part of Georgia. Go down to the coast and you're looking at really soft sandy ridges. The sandy ridges are actually lost barrier islands. These are barrier islands from when sea level was higher on the coastal plain and sand ridges that mark exactly where the islands were. Geologists mapped these back in the 1960s. And when they mapped these, they gave some of them Native American names and some of them more modern English names after the different barrier island chains that represented when sea level was there at that time. Now, if you go down to the Georgia coast today and look at my little map there on the right, the color coded red, those are from the Pleistocene epic islands where the coastline was located about 40, 50,000 years ago. And then the yellow you see there, the yellow is where you have the modern shoreline. So we have the Pleistocene back in the Pleistocene epic, and then the Holocene, what's been happening in just the last five to 10,000 years or so. So what's neat is you can go to some of the Georgia Barrier Islands and then some of those islands actually are going to be, oh, just uh, those islands are going to be just 40, 50,000 years old in parts of their shoreline. So right here is Silver Bluff shoreline. This is on uh, St. Catherine's Island. And then there's the Holocene Island that's on the left. Over on the right, there's Ossabaugh Island. What's cool about Ossabaugh is you actually see the split between the shorelines there, is during the Pleistocene, the shoreline was fairly close, fairly close to what it is today in the Southern Islands. But as you go further north, if you go to Ossabaugh, 
and then Wausau Island, they diverge. So this Pleistocene Silver Bluff shoreline in Ossawa, if you follow it a little bit farther north, that's actually going to coincide with Skidaway Island, and it's going to coincide with Savannah, the city of Savannah. Whereas Wausau and Tybee Island are representing the modern shoreline. Here's how geologists did that. This, it looks like a magic trick, but it's not. <laughs> these geologists in the 1960s, they had these modern ghost shrimp burrows that were occurring on the shorelines, the modern Holocene shorelines. They were able to use those as search images to find the fossil examples. So over on the left, there's a modern ghost shrimp burrow eroding out of the surf on Sapelo Island. On the west side of Sapelo, if you dig down into some of the Pleistocene sediments, you can actually find some of these trace fossils. These are trace fossils of, of some of those ghost shrimp that were from 40, 50,000 years ago, which shows you exactly where the shoreline was then. So the shoreline actually fluctuated and the ghost shrimps went with it. So wherever you find the ghost shrimp burrows, those were very reliable indicators of where exactly the shoreline was in the past. So geologists were able to then use ichnology to tell where, geologically speaking, these islands were back in the past. So here's some of these examples of ghost shrimp traces that you can look for on your own. If you go down to the shoreline, you might see the lower part of the burrow, which kind of looks like a wine bottle. You see that narrow aperture right there. The ghost shrimp lives down here. The S stands for shaft. This is a burrow junction, a tunnel connection, and then the T is for the tunnels that you have. What they do is they reinforce their burrows with little balls of sand. They paste it using good old reliable 100% all natural ghost shrimp spit, and that then reinforces the burrow. If you look on the surface, look on the surface of the beach, you might see these little, they look like chocolate sprinkles. Do not eat them. They are not chocolate sprinkles. Do not eat them. They are fecal pellets. Yes, these are feces that are mud particles, mud pellets pumped out of the burrow by the shrimp. So these are all traces that you can see of ghost shrimp down at the shoreline. And this is what they look like you can understand why they're called ghost shrimp because they're kind of pale. They're almost transparent. They also prefer to stay hidden. They don't want to be seen by people. They burrow down anywhere from two to four meters or as much as 10 feet below the surface. You have these massive networks of ghost shrimp burrow systems down there. So be looking for these traces and think of those underground cities of ghost shrimp beneath your feet on the beach. Now let's talk about the marshes. If you go to the marshes, you see, of course, the beautiful a green Spartina cord grass going across the landscape there. And if you look closely along the edges of where you might have some of the tidal creeks, some of the tidal channels, you might see some of the oysters, like on the left, or in some of the more muddy or sandy open areas, you might see my favorite animals, fiddler crabs <laughs> that are out there waving their claws, look at my claw, while they're out there on the surface. They are burrowing, they are leaving sand pellets on the top, and then the uh, oysters and mussels are also pumping out mud in those environments. So when you look at this from above, and this is a drone shot of the, um, an aerial shot of some of the marshes and the tidal creeks on Sapelo Island, when you look at that from above, I want you to be thinking about that as an ichnological landscape, that the entire marsh is composed of traces, traces my, made by these oysters, mussels, um, the uh, fiddler crabs, and other animals that are living in that marsh. What's cool is if you go to Sapelo Island, go to the north end of Sapelo Island, on Cabretta Beach, there is an old marsh there that's eroding out of the shoreline. And there's a picture of me from 2004 uh, where I was walking along that, but you can still see it. Go down there in 2020, you will still see it there. That marsh is about 500 smooth cord grass, Spartina, 
still preserved in it with the root traces. You can even see in parts of this old marsh, some of the tidal channels and see those white spots in the middle. Those are some of the clams and some of the oysters that were originally living in that tidal creek. So on the left, there's a tidal creek on Sapelo, a modern one. On the right, that's the originally buried old 500 year old tidal creek that's then preserved there. So we geologists and paleontologists, we use these modern examples, but these almost getting fossilized, almost in the geologic record examples to also interpret these environments. And in the surface, you can see some of the mussels and you can see remnants of the smooth cord grass still preserved there, 500 years old. On the right, this is a cross section where you can actually see some of the fiddler crab burrows. So I'm showing some of the fiddler crab burrows there, but also some of the root traces and the roots themselves from the smooth cord grass, the Spartina, still preserved there. What's also neat is look carefully, you might actually see modern smooth cord grass growing in exactly the same mud where the old cord grass grew 500 years ago. This is a cautionary tale for geologists and paleontologists, because if we find root traces in the fossil record, and we say, oh, these are all from the same community living at the same time, we might be wrong. <laughs> so that's a great example of where these 500 year old root traces and these modern root traces are completely separated in time. So be careful about that if you're a geologist or paleontologist interpreting something like this. Now let's go back to the beach. We go back to the beach and you look at the dunes and you might see tracks that look like this. You start counting the impressions and you go, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And you think, hmm, eight legs. And you would be correct. The animal that makes this has eight walking legs. It also digs deep burrows and it also leaves big piles of sand balls outside of its burrows. This is one of my favorite animals on the Georgia coast. This is from a ghost crab. Ghost crabs also make these Y-shaped or J-shaped burrows, this is in cross-section of a dune on the left in Sapelo Island, that are very distinctive in the fossil record. Over on the right, there's a former student of mine. Uh, I want to call her Dr. Stearns, Dr. Uh, Dottie Stearns, because she's studying to be a medical doctor now. There she is standing next to this fossil ghost shrimp burrow, making the same sort of Y pattern. And this is in a geologic formation in the Bahamas. So with this, I want you to be thinking about how we geologists, again, use these modern examples from the Georgia coast to apply to the fossil record. So what do ghost crabs look like? You'll sometimes see them running very fast along the shoreline. You'll sometimes, very rarely, you'll sometimes see them run down to the shoreline and sit down in the surf. And that's when they'll leave these really cool traces of where they were thirsty and they were sucking up water into their gills because they have combination little lungs and little gills because they're living partly in the water, partly on land. So I was able to actually get this close up beautiful portrait of this ghost crab where it was drinking up <laughs> after a long, night, a long night outside of the burrow. And this is the sort of trace it would leave. So if you go to the Georgia coast, be looking at low tide for these. These are examples of where these ghost crabs got thirsty and they settled down into the surf to get some water back into their bodies. Look closely during the summer and you may see these tiny, tiny little trails, these little trails. And when you look in the trails, in the middle of the trails, you will see a, a tiny little groove in the middle. That is from the tail of a horseshoe crab. And the horseshoe crabs, they're done mating now, but earlier in the summer, they made it. They, the eggs got fertilized. I won't draw a diagram for you, but the eggs got fertilized and then baby horseshoe crabs were crawling around on the surf, leaving trails. On the right, this is a smallish, small horseshoe crab that could fit in the palm of my hand. They grow up, they get bigger. Again, geologists and paleontologists use these as examples 
of how we can find sometimes the same trail left by a horseshoe crab from, this is from the Jurassic on the left, from 150 million years ago. And then we see the trails on the right, that's from Sapelo Island from about 2009 or so. You can see these and make these direct comparisons. We don't always get the animal at the end of the trail, but if you get the tracks, you can interpret who made them. If you ever find a shell on the Georgia coast and you find this little drill hole in it, it is a drill hole of this animal on the left. This is a moon snail. That's a live one on the left. That is a very dead one on the right. And that very dead one also was drilled into it by one of its sown species. So this is not only a predatory trace, it is a cannibalism trace. So be looking for those if you go on the Georgia coast. And yes, you can make an earring or a necklace out of that and have an earring of death or a necklace of death. Won't that be fun? Oh, go up into the dunes, go up into the dunes and look for these little half moon shaped burrows. Those are from burrowing mother wasps. So these burrowing mother wasps are digging down into the sand. They are making these long burrows in which they, they put their paralyzed prey and they lay eggs on them. And yes, these are good mother wasps that they're just trying to feed their children. So they're paralyzed prey, they can't move, the baby wasps hatch out of their eggs and chow down on the hapless animal. Poor thing. Anyway, it fossilizes. Sometimes this behavior fossilizes. So over on the right from Montana, this is a fossil cocoon, which I did a study of that with another paleontologist, these cocoons. Is there's another one and there's some more over there. These are actually examples of fossil wasp cocoons and burrows. See the burrow attached to the cocoon right there. So this is a great example of where we can again use what we see on the Georgia coast and apply that to what we see in the fossil record from tens of millions of years ago. Okay, now we're getting to, yes, I mentioned fiddler crabs, I love fiddler crabs. I mentioned ghost crabs, I love ghost crabs. I really like these animals a lot. These are alligator tracks. These alligator tracks were made on a salt marsh. So alligators sometimes go in salt marshes, sometimes they go onto the beaches, sometimes they go through the woods. I have encountered alligators in almost every environment on the Georgia coast. <laughs> they get around a lot. What I wanted to show you with these tracks is these are very fresh tracks. These were made at low tide. Big alligator walks along the uh, sand flat in this uh, part of a salt marsh at low tide. Just an hour later, this is what the tracks look like on the right. Fiddler crabs. Yes, these fiddler crabs had almost completely erased those giant, giant archosaur tracks, these tracks made by that alligator. The same thing happens on the shorelines where the alligators go out for seafood. So sometimes they're swimming around in the water. And I've seen this many times where their tracks are going into the water or coming up out of the water. What's really neat about this is you can tell the freshness of it. And you can tell sometimes how long ago this happened by the ghost crab tracks. Look over on the right you'll see where the ghost crabs have started erasing the tracks of the alligators. Yeah, so this is an example of where sometimes you have to get there while they're still fresh. Otherwise, the crabs are going to erase the evidence of those alligators being there. And if you don't believe me that these tracks are showing an alligator out in the surf, finally saw it. A couple of years ago, my wife Ruth and I, we. We had been tracking the alligators for several days. We go out there, we actually saw an alligator out in the surf. This was a relatively small one. I got this nice close up, isn't it beautiful? So yes, there you go. Your surf alligator Wednesday. Just what you needed, right? It to lift your spirits. <laughs> so tracks can help you then with interpreting behavior you may not actually observe. I had been seeing these tracks for years. We had been seeing these tracks for years, but that was the first time we'd actually seen alligators in the surf. Now, what's cool is you can actually see then evidence of crocodilians going back in the geologic past where they've done this. That's a picture on the left of me on Sapelo Island, 2001. They actually came up on a sandbank, 
laid down its body, and there's the body impression of the alligator. On the right, that happened about 120 million years ago. <laughs> That's just a little bit north of Moab, Utah, uh, where a crocodilian laid down on a sandy bank on a lake shore, where there were also some dinosaur tracks nearby. This is again an example of modern ancient comparisons where we can take these, these traces of behavior from the past and interpret them of then going into the more deep past. Another example from the Cretaceous, on the left, I have the tracks of a bird that landed on a shoreline on Jekyll Island. This is from a great egret, those beautiful white wading birds that as they land on the surface, you see those scrape marks from the rear toes as they come in for a landing. On the right, there's one track preserved in the sandstone from Australia from about 105 million years ago, where you can see the same thing, where this bird came to a screeching halt and its rear toe actually scratched the surface of the sand on the shore, on the shore uh, next, to, next to a river, on a river bank. So there's the modern one on the left, a fossil one on the right. And I actually drew this because this was a major discovery in that these were the oldest bird tracks in Australia. So I used this as an example of how that bird would have made that track as it's coming in for a landing. One foot lands, leaves a long scrape mark. Before the other foot lands, that claw has not landed yet. This is the sort of trace it would leave from that first foot contacting the sandy surface as it's flying. So now, this last part of the talk, I want to talk a little bit about what these traces can tell us as we go into the future. What's happening now is sea level is going up as a result of climate change. As sea level has gone up over the past 100 years on the Georgia coast, we're starting to see also more storms hitting the Georgia coast, and they are causing these deposits of sand. Notice I said it's deposits of sand that wash over the landscape this is on Jekyll Island, washing over the landscape, and they're from storms. We geologists call these storm washover fans. So yes, if you're taking notes, I'd write that down, storm washover fans. <laughs> these fan-like deposits of sand then are covering, in this instance, covering the environments that were next to the beach. So you see the beach way out there, here are some trees that are starting to die in the surf because of sea level going up. And the sand was delivered by Hurricane Matthew just a few years ago. This was actually covering, this is actually covering this former marsh. Now we're looking at a satellite image. The satellite image is showing that the beach is now moving west. So there's the beach over to the right. That's east. It's breached the forest. So this is the so-called tree bone yard on Jekyll. If you've been up to that north end of Jekyll, uh, this is probably familiar to you. Over here, that's the bike path. Notice the bike path at that time was no more. <laughs> that the storm actually breached the bike path. And then you can see the sandy deposits are actually getting transferred, transferred over to this salt marsh to the west. So what happens with the traces is that now the animals are moving with the environments. So the sand fiddler crabs are now burrowing in what used to be a, a muddy salt marsh. They're also burrowing over here and again, what used to be a salt marsh. The beach traces now are moving this way too. So all of these animals are moving laterally as sea level goes up. So this really cool psychedelic looking artwork here, wow, man, cool. My wife, Ruth and I, she's an artist too. What we did was we created this for an art show that was science-based and we wanted to show this vertical sequence of traces from down at the bottom. This is where we are now, where you have root traces from, from plants that are along the dunes. You have sea turtle nests and you have ghost crab burrows. You recognize that Y right there. These are some insect burrows. And you recognize that moon snail shell that has a hole in it. As sea level goes up, as sea level goes up, you're going to have 
animals from offshore are going to start burrowing into that and leaving their traces. So then you're going to see ghost shrimp burrows. You're going to see sea star traces. You will also see traces of other animals that normally live in the surf zone. So I have on the right, here's an interpretive diagram that geologists then can actually use these past traces to predict what's going to happen in the future with sea level rise as these laterally adjacent, these environments that are next to one another, laterally adjacent environments succeed one another vertically. So it's a very simple geological principle then that we with the traces can apply this to predict what's going to happen as sea level keeps going up, as storms start taking those sediments over the coast. So just a little summary is that traces tell us stories. So we can go down to the Georgia coast and we see stories that are written in the sand, mud, shells, bones, and any other substrate that will hold a trace that tell us about natural history of the Georgia coast and then human history of the Georgia coast. These traces and trace fossils, we can actually apply these worldwide. So you can use this to tell stories about rocks going back tens of millions or hundreds of millions of years. So these Georgia Coast stories, they're from the past and they're from the present, but we can use them also to predict the future. So with climate change and with sea level rise and more storms happening on the Georgia Coast, what's going to happen? Well, we have an app for that. And that app is called Ichnology. That Ichnology helps us then to better predict what's going to be happening with those environments and where these animals and plants are going to be going into the future. So if you're now totally into technology, or you even have some of these books, you've already read them, you can go back and reread them. My first book I wrote about the Georgia coast is called Life Traces the Georgia Coast. That was in 2013 with Indiana University Press. The middle one, some of you may have that book that came out in 2014, Dinosaurs Without Bones. That's about dinosaur technology, about tracks and burrows and nests and all of the traces that dinosaurs left. The one on the right, that's from 2017. That's the evolution underground about burrows and burrowing animals through time. So I know some of you have these books because I've probably met with you when I spoke at TELUS back in the past about each of these books. So, uh, so I thank you for getting those books in the past and hopefully you're, you're going back and you're going to review them sometime soon and read more about those stories. But if you don't want to get those books, I don't blame you. If you don't want to reread those books, I don't blame you. Okay, you can get a new one. And this new one is about the Georgia coast and tell some of the stories I just told you, but a lot more. So this is Tracking the Golden Isles. It's the natural and human histories of the Georgia coast. Uh, you can order it directly from University of Georgia Press. It doesn't cost any more to do that. And to do it on Amazon, it costs the same on University of Georgia Press, or better yet, better yet, support your local independent bookstore and try to order it through them. Or if you want to save some money, ask your library <laughs> to order it for you. And uh, if your library gets it, then a lot more people can read it. That's pretty cool. I love libraries and I love supporting them. Oh, the author website, you can go to that, ajmartinauthor.com, read a little bit more about each of those books. I'm on Twitter as Acknologist. I'm on Instagram, not as much as Twitter, but I'm also Acknologist on Instagram. And then there's a Facebook site for me too, Tony Anthony J. Martin, that you can go to that. I think that is actually it. I am going to now stop my screen share and I'm coming back. So that's all I have for my talk. And I have questions that were popping in, popping in, which I was really happy to see because then that gives me some questions to answer. So what I'll do is I'll, uh, yeah, Canty Smith sent me some of these. So one is, would fossilized tracks of dinosaurs give a good idea of the presence of soft tissues, not evident from fossilized skeletons? Absolutely, yes. I have seen this with some, uh, some dinosaur tracks, particularly in the Connecticut River Valley, that uh, some of those tracks are from the late Triassic, early Jurassic, from about mm, 200 to 210 million years ago. If you look at those tracks, 
Some of them have beautiful scale impressions in them. Absolutely gorgeous, exquisite preservation of those scales. Some of the alligator tracks I showed you earlier also have those scale impressions. So with that, we know that dinosaurs had scaly feet. Sometimes I've seen dinosaur tracks where the dinosaur foot actually stepped down into really gooey mud or sand. When they did that, you can actually see these lines, these parallel lines running down the side of the track as it stepped in. That is showing the scales on the side of the foot. Oh my gosh, first time I saw those, I was so excited because, whoa, I know what those are. Those are scale impressions. Once in a great while, I, I don't know of any that have been found yet. Some people have interpreted feather impressions. I don't quite believe those yet. <laughs> I want to believe in them, but I haven't found, I haven't seen any really convincing evidence yet because we know some dinosaurs had feathers, but we haven't found any really good convincing tracks, at least that would convince me that have feather impressions in them too. I have seen them with bird tracks before, but feather impressions with dinosaur tracks, haven't seen them yet. So yeah, that was a great question. And uh, who asked that question? Uh, Robert Allen Ayers, thank you for asking that. That's a good one. Okay, next one I have is, how can you see inside fossilized eggs without opening them? I don't do this, but I know the paleontologists who work on this. They do CT scanning, computer tomography. What they do is it's kind of, a, kind of an X-ray that they send through it. And what they do is they scan the egg, move it through where it's send, sending those X-rays, and then they reconstruct the density differences inside the egg. From that, they can actually reconstruct in 3D the skeleton, the embryonic skeleton of the dinosaur inside the egg. This is a really neat process because then they don't even have to open the egg. It's a non-invasive process in which they can have a 3D model that gives in great detail what the skeleton of the embryonic dinosaur looks like. So yeah, great question for that, okay? Uh, let's see, next one is from Clinton Lance Dooley. Is geology the same as geoscience? I would say yes, <laughs> geology is the same as geoscience. So geology is the study of the earth and its processes. Processes also include the history of the earth. So geosciences then is referring to just, we're trying to put the sciences back in geology because sometimes we have people like, uh, I don't know if you've ever watched, Oh, a Big Bang Theory, where one of the characters, Sheldon, likes to put down geology. He's like, geology isn't a real science. Let me do that. Sheldon, better not say that around me. So sometimes we put science in geology just to emphasize that, yes, indeed, it is a science. So geology, geoscience, yeah, I pretty much say those are the same. Okay, now, next question is, are there some tracks that you don't like because they're too similar to another animal's? How would you tell a duck from another kind of duck? Great question because I track birds. I track lots of modern animals and I love bird tracks. Sometimes I've asked myself this question when I have tracked ducks or geese. And I can tell the difference between duck and geese tracks even though they look very similar because of the size. So one of the things you do is you measure the width and the length of the track and the sizes sometimes will tell you, you can narrow it down then, what species you're looking at. With ducks, there are variations in the sizes, but also breeds of ducks. That makes that a lot more difficult. But I can definitely tell you the difference between duck tracks, goose tracks, and gull tracks. So, and then with gull tracks, I can tell you the difference between, say, a ring bill gull versus a, um, a laughing gull versus a herring gull versus some of the other gulls. That's mostly through size because the tracks look very similar, but but they are going to be different in the terms of their sizes. Where it gets really challenging is if you have a young herring gull hasn't quite grown up. That young herring gull compared to say a uh, 
say compared to a ring build gall, then there's going to be some overlap in that. Okay, and one more track question that I got. Isn't it difficult to track animals on the beach? It can be. <laughs> if there are a bunch of people around, they stop and they look at you like, oh, what are you doing? That's weird. Why are you staring at the ground? So that's one of the reasons why I love the Georgia coast is that look at that beach behind me. <laughs> no people. <laughs> that's Osama. <laughs> so if you can get to Osama, you can see that. St. Catharines Island, similar sort of thing. As a researcher, I get permission to go to some of those islands. But you can also go to Sapelo Island if you do a day trip. Take the ferry over to Sapelo, you might see that. Cumberland Island, you can do the same thing. Cumberland, you, there may be people there, but it's a really big island. So you can go tracking and not have so many people bothering you or stomping on the tracks that you're studying. Uh, on Cumberland, the problem I have there tracking there is that I might be tracking the animals and then some horse walks across them. <laughs> so that uh, sometimes makes it a little more challenging. But yeah, tracking on the beach, I love tracking on the beach. It's much more easy for me to track on the beach than on, say, um, say in a forest. I have done that kind of tracking, but it's not as easy as it is to track on a beach. Yeah, so great question. Thanks for asking that too. Any other questions from the studio audience? Are there any other questions? Well, if there aren't any other questions, I want to thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, wait, we're good. Great. Okay, so I just got I just got word from my boss at TELUS, <laughs> my boss for today. And I really, really appreciate all of you being here. I want to very much thank TELUS Science Museum for inviting me to give this talk. And I hope you had a good lunch and you were learning during lunch, which would be perfect for a lunch and learn event. So thanks a lot. And I hope to see you again. Happy reading, happy sleuthing. Bye-bye. <laughs>